The Fermi Paradox. Part 10. A select sun? The rare Earth hypothesis does not just encompass our planet. Our star is just as important. The sun is often said to be, quote, average. And while this is true in one sense, it is roughly median in terms of star size, it is also misleading. The vast majority of stars in our galaxy are small, dim, red dwarf stars, which make up about 85% of the total. Red dwarfs are not only smaller than the sun, their masses range from as much as 60% of the sun's mass to as low as 7%, but much, much dimmer. Their luminosities range from 7% of the sun to just 0.015%. This dimness is due to the fact that nuclear reactions within red dwarfs proceed much more slowly than they do in our sun. This means that, despite having less fuel, they will outlive our sun by many times its lifespan. Our sun's lifetime is estimated to be about 10 billion years. Red dwarfs may live as long as 20 trillion. Conversely, those rare stars substantially larger and brighter than the sun burn through their fuel like brush fires ending their lives in often spectacular fashion after just one billion or even as little as 10 million years. Given that it took at least 200 million years for life to emerge on Earth and 4.5 billion years for intelligent life, such large stars would seem to be out of the running as far as our search is concerned. So the first and most obvious requirement for a star to host a living planet is that it not be too large. But can it be too small? There is nothing that suggests that a planet orbiting a smaller star than the Sun cannot reach the right temperatures for life. All that changes is the distance from the star at which liquid water is viable, the so-called habitable zone. Oddly, there is no universally agreed value for the Sun's habitable zone, with some placing its inner edge as close as 0.5 astronomical units, half the Earth-Sun distance, while others place it as far as 0.99 astronomical units, 99% the Earth-Sun distance. This would put Earth at the very margin for habitability. Complications arise because habitability is not merely a factor of distance from the star. There are a number of other considerations, particularly the atmospheric makeup of the planet. Mars, for instance, is by some calculations within the Sun's habitable zone, but its small size and tenuous atmosphere means that it is currently too cold to host complex life. The most recent calculations, from 2013, place the center of the Sun's habitable zone at around 1.34 astronomical units, or most of the way to Mars. Remember though, red dwarf stars are much, much dimmer than our Sun, and their habitable zones are far, far closer. Gliese 581, a red dwarf roughly 20 light years from Earth, has a habitable zone centered at 0.15 astronomical units, or less than half the distance between the Sun and Mercury. Nevertheless, the star made headlines a few years ago when it was found to be hosting a large, potentially Earth-like planet within its habitable zone. So that would appear to clinch it. Red dwarfs, the commonest stars in our galaxy by an overwhelming margin, are perfectly capable of hosting planets in their habitable zones. Taken on its own, this is a huge boost for the search for extraterrestrial life, as it means that the number of potentially habitable worlds could reach tens of billions. Advocates of the rare Earth hypothesis argue, however, that just because a planet isn't a red dwarf's habitable zone, that doesn't make it habitable. Their argument rests on the closeness of the star's habitable zone. At such close distances to their stars, planets enter a state known as tidelock. They make one rotation around their axis for every revolution around their star. In layman's terms, their day is the exact same length as their year. The most famous case of tidal lock is that of our own moon which always shows the same face to us, meaning that complete maps and globes of the moon were impossible until the space age, when we could send probes to map its far side. The problem with tidal lock vis-a-vis -vis habitability, say the rare earthers, is that it makes heat transfer from one side of the planet to the other extremely difficult, to the point at which the sea on the night side would freeze solid. For heat to be effectively transported to the night side would require an atmosphere so thick that light would never reach the ground, preventing photosynthesis. However, research conducted around the time Rare Earth was published has effectively removed that constraint. Indeed, it is shown that a world with an atmosphere only a tenth as dense as our own 
could easily transfer heat around the planet. Red dwarfs do, however, possess one aggressive habit that could render them unsuitable for life. During their early years, they undergo massive convulsions, seething with solar flares and coronal mass ejections. These ructions would erode away the atmosphere of any Earth-sized planet close enough to be habitable. Evidence now suggests, however, that planets often migrate from their starting positions over time, and a planet that formed far enough away from a red dwarf to avoid its dangerous infancy, but then migrated inward after its adolescence, could avoid any harmful effects. And, once it was ensconced in its new orbit, the planet would have trillions of years to produce life, ecosystems, and intelligence. For all attempts to belittle the littlest stars, they might just be ideal cradles for life. However, a star's habitability is not only potentially constrained by size. Age is also important. At the birth of the universe, elements heavier than hydrogen and helium pretty much did not exist. This primordial hydrogen and helium collapsed into the first stars, which forged those heavier elements in their cores and then blasted them into the cosmos as they died, enriching it with planet-building material. As the universe aged, more and more had time to die and scatter their planet seeds throughout space. Eventually, new generations of stars were born shrouded in cosmic dust that increased the variety of elements within their atmospheres and formed disks that would coalesce into planetary systems. Evidence for this family history of the universe can be seen in stars today. Older stars than our sun have lower levels of heavy elements in their atmospheres, while stars younger than our sun have higher levels. This relative abundance is called metallicity because, for some bizarre reason, astronomers call all elements heavier than hydrogen and helium metals. Obviously, there must exist a relationship between a star's metallicity and its having planets, since one is impossible without the other. However, Recent studies have shown that the relationship is more complex than first supposed, with a major factor being the size of the star versus the size of its planets. For a star the size of the Sun, high metallicity is required for the formation of planets as large as Jupiter, though not to form planets the size of Neptune or Earth. Stars smaller than the Sun, however, do require higher metallicities to form planets in these lower size ranges. Since life-bearing planets are most probably at the bottom end of the size range, it seems unlikely that low metallicity will be much of a problem. Stars, it turns out, are big, and even a small amount of extra material would be enough to form a planet. But, rare earthers argue, it's not just the star that matters. The star system itself plays a role. And we will be examining the role it allegedly plays in the next episode.